A very good evening and welcome to everyone to another episode of Chai Chat Community. I am Dr. Chris Malika Bhadra and today we will talk about something that's very socially and mentally relevant in today's society. So we have actually decided to name this episode as the Uncomfortable And also since today is White Ribbon Day, the reason we celebrate this day is we want to raise awareness against men's violence against to women to subjugation to domestic violence. So that is the reason we are kind of dedicating our episode to raise up our voices and speak against ongoing problems of abuse, domestic, sexual, whatever abuse you might think of. And today I have two amazing people around with me on the table. I will move on to them, but before I'll start with presenting myself in case any of you uh, want to know more about me. Uh, I moved to Melbourne in 2013 for my PhD. I, get, I got a scholarship and I finished my PhD in 2017, so I've been working after that, it's normal work life. But when I'm not working, I'm actually either blogging or I'm podcasting or I'm dancing because I'm a trained Indian contemporary dancer. And if none of these, then I'm rehearsing my lines because I love doing my theater part. So that's, in a nutshell, that's me. Moving on to my two fabulous guest speakers, guests and friends as well. So I'll, I have with me Oz Malik and Zoran Seher. Welcome guys, and thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, Chris. Thanks. I'll start with you. Uh, why don't you tell us and our listeners a bit about yourself? Yes. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Oz Malik. I'm coming from uh, Bunurong and Wurundjeri land, which is uh, Melbourne. Uh, I'm very happy and very privileged to be part of this conversation. It's a very important topic. Um, a bit about myself. I am a community worker. I work around social issues. Um, especially to do with youth, uh, but also multicultural communities. Um, I'm also passionate about the art and international politics. So I like to do acting, but I also like to uh, talk about and be involved in world issues. Um, so I think the topic that we're talking about today, um, it's something that I'm very keen on, but also I want to raise awareness amongst uh, my own community, um, obviously the South Asian community, but also uh, young men. Um, changing attitudes and um, having a different perception um, to what they used to. So, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you for being a part of this. And now I move on to my second guest of the evening, Zoran. Please introduce yourself to our listeners. Hi, Chris, and hey, all. Uh, good to be here, guys. It's always wonderful to have a conversation which is such a relevant, such an honest, and such a prevalent issue in today's society, um, especially which um, you know with the changing mind that unfortunately the educated. Um, you know, we, we obviously just touch upon that as we go along, but a little bit about myself. I'm an actor, I'm, I'm into the entertainment industry. I'm a motivational speaker, a lot of a presenter, and a social media influencer. And I guess the realm of the work I've always wanted to be able to, uh, you know, sort of bring about a message, uh, bring about a change to the work I do, to the field of art. And I truly believe that a medium like a platform like cinema, like um, the entertainment industry, is perhaps the strongest, if not uh, one of them. Uh, where you know we are able to bring about a change, and I think the bringing about a change starts with a sense of attitude, starts with a sense of uh, sort of perception, um, and it's not just about what you say, it's about what you do, and and it's it's a, it's a way of life. And yeah, I think I've always been a conscious, um, you know, honest sort of thinker of um, you know humanity, especially uh, having grown up in a community where I've obviously always learned to respect women, been brought up by them, and I think they are the force behind who I am today. So I can't thank them enough for that. And, and when it does come to a conversation which is um, so unfortunately uncomfortable for the uh, majority of this world, I think that itself, you know, makes it an important conversation to have. So I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you, guys. Um, all right, I'll not take much time. I'll move directly into the conversation of the night. So the reason I brought up in my conversation, PhD has given me a lot of exposure. It's it's obviously what we know. It's not easy to do it, but. What I realized while I was doing it that it acts as an obstacle for a woman. Because the reason I say it, while I finished my PhD, my parents, like any other, they are going to you know, find someone else for me. And they got us registered to a matrimonial profile and so on and so forth. These conversations started happening with uh, prospective alliances. And soon I realized that after one of the initial conversations, the questions were just full of authority like they expected me to answer each and every question thrown my way like 
I was being told that I'm intimidating because I'm over-educated. I know that I have an aura which is not quite comfortable for a family to gel in. My mom thought that, you know, your daughter is over-educated, so she might not listen to our son, which is, I don't know, so wrong on so many levels to me. So there's an unassumed subjugation, assumed authority that most men have that a woman has to be answerable to any question that is thrown away, no matter where she is, no matter what she's doing. And that was the first time I had an interest with this misogyny or un unreal behavior toward an independent woman. Some point of time, they made me feel that, you know, independence is a sin or independence is criminalistic in nature. So th that is my experience. What do you guys have to say about that? What is your individual experience? I'll start with you, Zara. So I, a for one, of, of as I said, I've always been very privileged to uh, grow up in a kind of a um, society in a in a background uh, in a family where you know women have been treated very fairly, and I won't make any bones about that because. But I do know, and I'm quite aware of the fact that not everyone has been privileged to sort of see that side of life. Um, I, for one, think is extremely wrong because. Um, while there is an unfortunate sort of section of society which truly believes you mentioned the subjugation of women and how you know men come first, women come second, uh, I think it's got to do with some sort of a stigma which only comes when you uh, you know build a certain way of life. Um, which I think is completely wrong. It's unfortunate. Um, I think it's also why um, I truly believe more than education. It's about awareness. Um, and I think it starts from a very early age of your life when you uh, begin to kind of take a, you know, a, an honest learning towards what, you know, ethics are, what morals are, you know, how to sort of conduct yourself among, amongst people, uh, whether it's at your workplace, whether it's, you know, outside, whether it's in a social gathering, a public affair. Um, I think it is very, very important even for your relationships for that matter. You know, I think, uh, you know, the women that go through domestic violence, um, like you, you know, mentioned that there's this unfortunate um, inequality of perception, you know, where, where, you know, men can't do wrong and women are, you know, sort of secondary. Uh, that itself is a, a, a silly way of even thinking. And for if someone had to tell me this, that uh, what is your take on it? I would outright say, are you crazy? Uh, because because that's not even, it's, it's not a part of my psyche. Um, and and um, of course, there are a lot of people in this world. That's one of the reasons why we are sitting over here and discussing it. You know, it's led to so many unfortunate, you know, sort of cases of domestic violence, whether it's rape, whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's uh, physical abuse, or whether it's just even mental abuse. You know, uh, but but uh, th th there is there is no uh, sort of secret behind the fact that uh, it is an unfortunate world where women have always come to. Uh, work harder than men to be able to fit in and and demand this very basic thing and a very basic ingredient called respect um and 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 uh, that should not have to be sort of so difficult to get it should just sort of come with the flow uh i know i'm sitting over here and saying it in a very in a very easy way through a conversation but i know that um uh, I, I i mean genuinely saying i think it's so wrong it is absolutely wrong and and on a personal level um i absolutely condemn such uh, ways of thinking and condemn such people um and, and it's it's very difficult to kind of uh, understand this dynamic it is it is um moving on to you or uh, what is your opinion about all of this that's happening around the world even in the 20th century what do you think about it no i, I would Definitely share the same sentiment as Zora, and I, I think also just you know your experience, Chris, that you've just spoken about um, in terms of uh, how you're viewed, especially in the uh, I guess looking for a partner and and what type of woman that you have to be to be an adequate partner. I think a lot of that is, firstly, I think for us as men is that we have to listen to women. You know, that it has to change in terms of. Um, you know, obviously at the moment, this is a kind of a conversation, but the more we need to do more listening and less talking, I guess that's the first uh, and most important thing because we haven't been doing that. And I think the second thing is this perception about what makes, um, if we stick to the partner question, what makes an appropriate partner, it's very binary, you know, like we have this idea of like the masculine and the feminine and what fits into these categories. Um, obviously, coming from South Asian culture, you know, we have this understanding that the, the boy has to be a particular way and, and for the, the woman to be maybe uh, more sensitive and more timid and these sort of things. I think, you know, we really need to question that as a culture, you know, and, and as a people, um, what are the problematic aspects of that? 
and what are the things that need to finally change um you know even from my own personal experience and how i was brought up i know that there was a double standard where you know my mum maybe treated me better um than my sisters again why why is that happening you know and and what is the reason for this so we need to start having open and honest questions that doesn't mean there are parts of our culture that are always bad and this is goes across cultures you know this is universal the issue of um, misogyny and sexism but to do with the south asian community i think we do have a, a very double standard on what a what's okay for a man and what's not okay for a woman and if she doesn't fit that box then she's you know rebellious or she's not uh wife material or she's not you know proper Th that is a problem i think these uh perceptions of what it means to be a, a good girl or a good woman yeah. yeah i think more than that what you both said that it's most about the mindset it's also about you know as you are young men many men they the women in their life the first women in their life are usually their mothers i think it's it's a very important role for the mothers of the sons to play to kind of put the seed of thought in their minds that you know the next woman coming into your life needs that equal space she definitely yeah. need not be under you there's no concept of under or over right there are two different genders or three different genders we're not going there but each has their own special needs in their life so we cannot expect one is over the other so that woman mother figure has a very important role to play is what i feel yes and you know the other part that you both mentioned that the respect has to be there we see a lot of sexist jokes and you know like you know you in your colleagues you you for for circle these jokes in whatsapp groups and what not what are your takes on these sexist jokes do you think that these jokes somewhere also lead to this discrimination being in one form or the other or as a different Well, oh, definitely. I think language again is another uh, factor in uh, perpetuating this cycle of sexism and, and discrimination against women. You know, if you think it's okay to devalue somebody through words, then it's going to uh, replicate in your actions. Um, you know, the when when boys, this idea of you know when you're young and you have this childish attitude, I think. I was reading somewhere apparently you know young boys and and children you know they start picking up things when they're 3 years old of age you know at a very young age so I don't know if maybe from kindergarten we need to start teaching but you know the language that we use has an impact you know I I know just from discrimination what words can do you know I, and so I can't imagine sexist language and how that can prevent women so this isn't only a problem in obviously in the the w real world but on the virtual space as well um you know you look at twitter or facebook comments and youtube comments or comments on you know women's instagram i think again as men we need a the understanding of you know how do we actually speak on these platforms uh, the etiquette of speaking on these platforms what's a respectful way to give a compliment you know um a lot of the comments are sometimes etched in misogyny and dehumanizing the woman through the comments even if it's supposed to be a compliment you know it's that's uh, what i think we need to change as well how we comment on posts was the same uh, was the same zoran the same question to you considering you are a social media influencer yeah. what are your opinions and takes on sexist jokes being just casually taken and you know women are being made to assume that oh this is fine just get used to these jokes what is your take on it so there are two things in the way i look at it right there is the role of expectations and the role of expression um and, and much like what os said i completely agree i mean uh, you know uh, we we live in a day and age where the digital world definitely dictates our lives in more ways than one and it, and it, and the role of language is a big big thing the way the language is used the way in which it's kind of perceived um Uh, anything and everything you do especially on you know a digital platform is the way in which you market something and if you're packaging something in a way in which it's intended to hurt someone then of course the intention would be hurt and pain now when it does come to a very sensitive subject like discrimination um, you know sexist jokes yes it is absolutely wrong it's it's hurtful um many a times people say it with with a certain kind of an intention of just you know trying to be funny and not really hurting i i think that's where you have to really take into account as to who's saying it and what what's being said and to who uh and and many times you know there is a lot of misconceptions about what could perhaps could be hurtful 
and the right kind of people will say sorry about it they will apologize but on the whole i have to say that um uh, you know i think uh, the, the the younger generation the kids nowadays tend to pick up things much faster they tend to sort of grasp really quickly so i think you know when you lead by example when you are setting a certain trend when you speak to your child about the importance of ethics the importance of principles how much to value women um i've said this all my life and i will say it one more time i've i've um i, I think a woman is far more stronger than a man can ever be um, emotionally mentally morally socially um and and it's not about being physically strong it's about having the kind of real backbone which i think the women does have um uh, and i speak for myself over here because many times i've sort of you know quarreled behind an issue and and, and whether it's my mom or you know uh some of the past relationships i've been in uh, those are the kind of women who actually have been there for me and said you know what i'm going to stand very strong with you uh and and i know that many a times when you are on a sort of a family group i think the older generation the certain kind of a shift of generation does crack certain you know these random forwards uh, not keeping in mind with you know sort of um, what perhaps the uh, the connotation might be or what's what's the kind of uh, perception they're going with and i know with all their good intentions i know with all they obviously would not mean hurt um sometimes it doesn't sort of ring well and 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 i think uh, so what i think is apart from educating it's also to inform the right kind of people that listen i think it's funny to crack a joke but 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 try and make it funny which doesn't happen to be at someone else's expense um and and if we're talking about a women's uh, right to kind of feel respected i think that is not even that 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 is not much to ask about that is not much to ask for she just wants to sort of say that that hey you take a joke on a man can you and if you can do it then i think that's perfectly all right but yeah i think i uh, so two things i think um, what you're expecting and from who's saying it and 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 the way you're saying it which i think is expression absolutely agree and i think here we have also established the fact that language has to be first and foremost monitored in respective households because that's where the children learn at the very initial stages what their parents how their parents are talking to each other right yeah on that note i think the probably the next question i have for you both is how in that situation then we control normalizing the concept of domestic abuse in residences like i can give you a very i can give you a very relevant example that i saw in my own eyes i was in delhi and um, i was just wrapping up my night and i went off to sleep and around 1:30 at night my mom hears a loud thud on our main door she goes up to see what happened is our next door neighbor they had a quarrel and in the heat of it and the husband was drunk so he just dragged the wife by the nape of her hair and pushed her on her main door and she's freezed she's frozen my mom is frozen the next day my mom is like do you want us to report it to the police do you want us to kind of speak up on your behalf and she's like nay nee, bhabhi it's okay you know he was just drunk perhaps he was just angry so this is the way most of the households normalize this situation this can't be normalized right this is not healthy so how do we prevent this from getting normalized what do you guys think we should do so that these situations can be taken more seriously zorana i'll start with you first first i'm really sorry for the person who had to go through it because i don't think anybody let alone man woman i think women especially who go through it should ever have to be the victims of such absolutely heinous disgusting uh, terrible crimes and acts of violence and i think this is perhaps uh, an example of why uh, all the more uh, you know i think we need to kind of instill a sense of um you know e- educating our kids and I, especially you know the girl child or you know even even boys when they're young and i think it is very very important for a mother to talk to the son and let them know that listen if i can be an example and if your dad can be an example of how much he respects me you better be an example in the future of how you respect your wife or, or your daughter uh second of all i think when you have a certain kind of a platform or a voice like social media which i have had for quite some time and i think it is accessible to uh, 7 billion people on this planet um uh, it, it is also very important to how, how i think for me and i can only speak personally uh as an influencer uh, what is the most important thing is how are you structuring yourself on a digital platform to be able to influence an audience that wants to listen to you and follow you for your content now content can be driven purely by how many numbers it's getting you and sometimes numbers uh, only come to you because of the masala or the kind of excitement that you kind of put into it uh, uh sorry to break this amazing breaking news that domestic violence has no masala to it it's it's a it's a far more serious issue it's a far more uh, uh you know important issue very relevant issue and 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 it's a very painful issue and that is one of the reasons why it needs to be spoken about much more um i think 
the, the I, I, I'm I'm no sort of um, sort of saying talking about you know what should happen in the future, but I think one of the ways that I can perhaps look at this is if we are given a platform like social media, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, even a small little kind of a post that talks about the importance of you know respect uh, talks about you know sort of uh, you know taking care of your women you know sort of uh, what, what, what you know because they say there are no nothing like perfect marriages i don't believe anything in this world is perfect but i mean in the name of something not being perfect doesn't mean it has to be violent it does not have to be disgusting there can be respect there can be a sense of uh, you know sort of uh, you know compatibility uh, you kind of share a kind of a partnership together uh, i don't think women are really asking for too much um, you know, and and I've always and I've always said this that I didn't, I, I don't I really do not think that it's very difficult to uh, take care of the women you have in your life. Uh, but to kind of showcase certain acts of violence just to pro, uh, to, to, to to show how strong you are, uh, I think a is a sign of insecurity, um, and it's also uh, something which reflects upon you as a person and and your morals and ethics. Um, and and I think that genuinely starts from the way in which you're brought up. Uh, so if you are creating that example as you're a child, uh, chances are your son or daughter are looking at it and, and, and they might be a victim of it or they might be a follower of it. So uh, a lot of this has to begin at a very early age. So you can, if you can educate your kids in school, education also has to happen from home. You raise a very interesting point here, Azran, probably. Um, I want to raise this up. You say that um, it's about respect and it's about the mothers teaching the son. And the yeah. social media impact, but what about many households in let's say India or Pakistan, maybe, who do not have access to social media yet? How do yeah. we reach them inside yeah. their closed doors, and how do we enlighten them that look, whatever you're doing is not right, unethical to say the least? Yeah. How do you, both of you, think? Both of you are like heavily on social media. Even I am. So everyone is, yeah. but yeah. All, are, all are related people are not there. How do we enlighten them? What are your thoughts on it? Look, I think I'll be very honest. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, um, I was just going to say, um, touching on what Zoran said before and, and the question just quickly before, I think the, the issue here as well is that we have to think why does the woman feel she can't go to the police first? And we have to understand what were the frameworks in place? What, what is the culture in place? What is the structures in place? that makes her feel like she can't go? Is it because the police won't believe her? Is it because she's been brought up to mm -hmm. say that you can't uh, speak out against your husband? Is it because as a young girl, she was growing up and this violence and sexism against her was normalized? I think those questions need to be really looked at. And as a culture, whether it's religious leaders, whether it's schools, police, um, we need to make it safe for women to feel like they can go and report, you know, domestic violence and crimes and that it's okay, you know, and the safety mechanisms in place. And, you know, whether they, if it's through, you know, anonymity, whether it's through a next door neighbor, we just need to create that culture of like, it's okay to do these things. Because I think a lot of the hesitation comes from that historical baggage of, and that social pressure. So again, that's something that as a society we need to do. Just if people don't have social media, again, similarly, like, yes, social media is one apparatus. A lot of the world isn't on social media. Um, and so I think for them, again, it's back to normal. Get in contact with religious leaders, uh, your local counselors, your ministers, what's happening on, you know, mainstream media, TV, celebrities. Can we be promoting these messages through our artists, through our social workers, through our teachers? Um, this needs to be something that everyone does. Um, this is really interesting just on um, sport for a second. I remember when the Indian cricket team wore their mum's uh, names on their back of their shirt, you know, and just bringing that up. Um, but, you know, we're talking about mums and daughters a lot here as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, it shouldn't matter if that they we can like to compare them or if they were your mother or if they were your daughter. No, it, even if they weren't your mother or your daughter, you should just treat them with respect. You know, we don't have to put that, oh, if you were my mom, then I would treat you with respect. No, like we did it again, you know, change that idea. I agree. I agree. It should not be selective respect. It should be a universal globe, universal respect toward every woman, I think. 
And uh, Zoran, another thing that you mentioned that uh, my man, my, my reaction of insecurity. Yeah. What insecurity does he have? If you, for example, if you are my partner, if you are my wife, why would I be insecure? You yeah. are already in my life. You hold a very special place in my heart. What factors do? What factors actually lead to a man being insecure about his partner, whatever it be? What do you think? So just before I answer that, I want to also just add to one more thing that Oz said. Um, one of the ways in which we can bring about awareness without the importance of social media, because a lot of people don't have access to it, is to set up local counselling centres uh, for the lower middle class, wherever in the backward areas of India or wherever in the world they may be, where it's accessible and affordable to the people who are victims of it, especially uh, the women who are being abused. Um, and obviously, they don't have any kind of uh, you know exposure to the real world through a digital platform. And these are the kind of centers that would actually help them, counsel them, talk to them, and give them a sense of home, um, give them a sense of hope, and, and, and kind of, uh, I guess, work around, you know, uh, educating their partners or, or give them the kind of shelter and protection um, from actually, you know, uh, suffering from the ones who are suffering from that domestic violence. Um, coming to your second point, you said insecurity, why a man goes through it. Um, well, to my mind, the only two things that can come to uh, that, that really come up the order is the fact that when you, uh, I guess, the nature of uh, human nature is such that if you don't get what you truly want, uh, you'll go to any extent to get that. Um, and, and that's a very sad, sad story. It, it kind of applies in every situation, in every part of life, in every generation, uh, in any sort of industry that we're kind of situated in. Um, I think uh, speaking about men and, and, and uh, you know, Oz and me being uh, two men over here, I, I can say for a fact that I think I um, have been through, uh, you know, sort of situations in my life where sometimes, I mean, many a times, many a times, actually more often than not, a woman is right. And she knows what she's saying, you know, whether, whether, you know, they always say women has an int uh, intuition, you know, and when, when a woman knows you can't, you know, you can't mess with her. So just, just let it go and let her do her thing. And I've come to the understanding that, you know what, that is absolutely 100% true and right. Uh, I think it's got to do with, um, again, uh, the, 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 the underlining thought is equality of importance. If you are equal in uh, how, in how much of importance you're getting, then I think, uh, and this is again speaking technically on behalf of men, not men. Uh, you know, this is how the thinking is. But if you are very, very sure of who you are as a person, irrespective of gender, irrespective of what you're doing, irrespective of your mother having to hit you and say you're wrong, um, for treating a girl wrong, you won't feel that secure insecurity. I think insecurity again also comes with uh, having no a sort of backward, um, you know, education about how you're supposed to be treating women in society, how how you're supposed to present yourself when you're talking to someone. Where is the etiquette? Where is the sort of um, you know sort of um, just a sense of understanding? You know, putting 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 them before you. Uh, I think it's got to do with a bit of a cultural flaw also, and I think we see a lot of it in yeah. India. Um, and the fact that I've come from a place like that, I've never seen it firsthand because I've been, you know, I've been in a been in a sort of very privileged background where you know women have been respected uh, wholeheartedly and fully. Um, but yeah, it does happen, and 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 insecurity is something that purely comes from the fact that it, it's it's got to do with why am I not getting the importance, and who is she to tell me uh, when I'm wrong? And I think okay. this unfortunate way of uh, you know dealing with life is just so wrong because if she's saying something that is good for you it doesn't matter if it came from a woman she means well for you um you know and i think many times men think that if a woman has to correct them uh, she knows more than you uh, it's not about her one-upping you it's not about saying that she's more intelligent than you um actually behind that is a lot of care and affection if you really do think about it mm -hmm. uh, just on that zoran i think you know like uh, you mentioned an interesting point before as well about like, you know, life isn't going to be perfect or a marriage will have its ups and downs or flaws yeah. or when you're in a relationship or, and I think that's, you know, that's the kind of the tragic reality of life that we go through ups and downs, men and women and, and people in general. It's just that what are the tools and skills and I guess the, what are we providing our young men yeah. to have when they go through these situations and do they have the right like you said etiquette the skills so when they do have a bad day how, how do you, when you come back home what is the correct kind of way to release your anger is it going to the gym is it going like we need to almost teach our sons and you know men 
how to be angry in a productive yeah. way because yeah. anger is a part of life sadness is a part yeah. of life Trust is a part of life so even um you know having arguments and discussions you will have arguments and discussions with your yeah. uh better half and your relate yeah. and you'll but how do you communicate during that difficult situation you know there is a way to communicate productive yeah. uh and i think those intricacies because we can all say okay we're against domestic violence we're against violence against women yeah but what do we what does that actually mean step by step and i think these little things about how do we communicate when we are frustrated when we there is a fight those nuances have to be addressed i wanted to yeah chris and, and zoran please if if you have any advice on that um please touch on that well i just advise with no, no, I'm bringing, I definitely, I mean, to answer your question, I definitely use the gym very often if I'm upset. <laughs> but, but, but no, I think on a more serious note, um, uh, you, uh, you have to find less destructive ways to be able to handle anger and, you know, um, uh, I guess a sense of depression or whatever it may be, which is kind of, you know, uh, you know, bringing out a very negative response if, if a woman is trying to correct you for, for the better. Um, I've, I've, I've said this, uh, and actually it's funny, like just, just today evening, I was talking to a very close friend of mine and she's a girl and, and she's so close to me and I've known her all my life. And, and, you know, I think unknowingly we have a rule between us that if I'm wrong, she will tell me you're wrong. And, 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 uh, she's like, and, and she's, she gives it to me on my face. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gives it in a way. And she's like, I, I'm saying it to you because it hurts. And I said, you know what? I, and every time it, it, it irritates me, it irritates me today. I said, you know what? Actually, this is why I like you so much. Because you're unabashedly, unapologetically saying it the way it is. And that is the way it should be. You know, because it's honest and real, you know, because when you have, when you're in a position of power, when you're in a position where, you know, on, on, on again, social media with so many thousands of followers, you tend to have all these yes men around you where everyone says you're good looking and amazing and this and that. And, and you don't have that one or two people which you can count on your fingers telling you, no, I think you're pathetic and come back down to earth. And I think that's where a woman does a fantastic job of just putting it in your face and saying, no, you have to learn to be grounded. You have to be, learned, you have to be a bit more sensitive, be a bit more understanding. And I think if you're getting the success, then I think you have to kind of have a sense of gratitude. I think gratitude is very, very important. Um, and, and I think also one of the ways in which I constantly keep reminding myself when especially things aren't going my way or uh, perhaps feel um, you know, upset, not even got to do with the woman, but, but even if that happens to be the case, I'm I'm constantly in tune with the idea of how I've been in life, and and, and just just sort of thanking the universe that it could be much worse. Um, and and most times that's the answer to my question. I agree to partly both of what you said, but again, uh, it's a fact to remember that we all, at least the three of us, we come from privileged families. We have had a lot of education. Our parents were educated. Our grandparents were educated. So we've had that lineage where people came with education and common sense in their minds, right? A lot of families where this is not present. So it's still ongoing. As I think one of the viewers just commented, Samira said, change begins at home. And I absolutely agree. It's only inside the house that you can actually have a initiating change. A man who's already grown up to be 21, 22 years of age, and he gets married or he is in a relationship, whatever, you can't expect that man to start behaving overnight. And you can't expect grace and etiquette coming out of that individual, right? Because these things are instilled in you at a very early age. So until unless change is at that grassroots level, which I think is the need of the hour now, we can't expect much coming out of any. We can talk to them, we can connect them with councils, but again, it's when you come back home, what is the basic reaction you're getting from your immediate family? You might try to, you might want to speak normally, but at the end of the day, you see your father, your mother, they, misbehaving or whatever inside is happening it's just a different story altogether so it's again change has to happen from the grassroots level and another thing both of you mentioned that we need to set up councils right council centers but i've seen in a lot of places at least in india even the council centers the people who run these centers they mm. have that ethical mindset yeah not to change their mindset. If if I'm the head of the council and I am deeply skilled with the power of the male, woman has to be on top or man has to be on the top of the train, no matter what, I will eventually turn half the thing off. So how do you mitigate that situation? How do we end that problem? Like we need those institutions to be free 
of any bias. We know that other institutions people welcome any and every guest to open up. But more often than not, you see that these institutions are the places where you find very, very opinion. What are yeah. your opinions on that? I think if well, if we look, you know, say back in the motherland, like say places like India or Pakistan, I think they're having more women in those places of power makes a difference. Like representation in, say, if we see women in uh, politics or women in business and, and in the sports teams, I think that changes a lot of things as well, that social culture. Again, um, ideology is one thing, but I think it's just important that we have women in these places of power and, 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 and I guess, working up that, whether it's business hierarchy or uh, education, engineering, whatever it is, we need more representation of women in these areas. So facilitating that. Um, but you're right, it, it is a, it's very challenging in terms of the households and, and how we change that. Uh, this is a thing where I think that takes the whole community and we must have, I guess, if you have one person that comes out of the house we need to make sure that there's respect for women at the local shop that he attends, that the respect at the local mosque or temple or gurdwara that he attends, that there's respect for when he goes to the cricket team. What are the policies? Like, there needs to be, and if we can't bring it inside the house, let's try to create a culture outside the house. And so when whenever that man or boy interacts, he'll know, oh, this is how people behave on this stuff, sort of stuff. I think that's kind of the only way we do it, you know. Um, it's very hard to police inside the house. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of what comes to mind. But changing, yeah, I think representation of women is so important in those places because once we have women in those places, then policies and respect can kind of, uh, I guess, be inbuilt through that. Enough, Zoran, anything to add on that? Well, I think, yeah, I, I truly think um, it is a very challenging thing to do. It is very difficult. And I think once you sort of set yourself on the way in which uh, you operate and have lived your life, of course, to break the pattern is, you know, night and day. But the one thing I, I think is in your hands and capacity is to have better table conversations and, and dinner conversations. And I think that is a, essentially a big, big um, sort of influencing factor in the way in which you, you know, you grow, the way in which you think, when you're, you know, from a school age to a college year, uh, uh, and and that practice can only be inculcated by a parent, um, you know, to be able to have that ability and thinking that you know life will be uh, a bit more open. Uh, I think if it, as having grown up in a background which is privileged, one thing my parents always did was they never imposed any restrictions on me. I was never sort of told to do nothing. And at the same time, I always valued that. So, you know, it could either go, it could either go this way or that way. Um, so that's one, um, have better table conversations and, and constantly engage your child in, in, a, in a conversation that uh, talks about reality and not, and not creating some sort of a fantasy illusion about what life may be. Uh, because essentially, uh, and, and, and I hate saying it because I happen to be a part of the film industry where that kind of creates an alternative reality. And sometimes that reality isn't what, you know, uh, that reality on screen isn't what actual lives we live are. Uh, we, we, we don't we don't sing and dance and sort of saris falling off. Uh, uh, I, I wish that was the case. But but um, so I think to kind of talk things, talk, uh, sort of have conversations which are more pertinent to the current affairs of how things are and how life may be. Um, and yeah, like I said, I think, you know, we have uh, women uh, sort of leading the world currently, essentially, uh, the latest one being the vice president of the United States of America um, and, 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 and her agenda for the longest time, because I've been following the campaign and stuff, has been to kind of talk about promoting not just women empowerment, but actually change the mindset of culture. You know, it's uh, we, you talk about empowerment often and say uh, women need to be given a fair share and equality. But 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 that's but that's one thing to just say. But to create that empowerment to be uh, is, is to be able to change a mindset in the way in which people think, um, which is the actual hard work, which is the, which is the hardest thing to do. So if you can change that mindset, then I think the rest follows. Amazing. And also, do you, do you believe that like mental health, that taboo of mental health needs to change as well, probably in this area? Because I, I believe that understanding, and it's very deep, but going into a family's trauma, understanding, you know, why maybe certain things are happening 
if we take that taboo away from mental health, psychology, uh, seeking yeah. therapy, these kind of things, you know, at the parental level um, and making sure that w if you go to counsel, that it's okay that you go to a counsellor for your marriage or if you go to therapy if you or talk to somebody. It can be, you know, the the monk or the, the local imam or the, uh, the person who works at the temple, your cricket coach, whoever it is, you know, talk to somebody and seek help. And then maybe through that, you can kind of gauge that, okay, this is what I'm not doing right. This is what I'm doing wrong. Kind of facilitating that we need to get away from mental health is a bad thing. That, but sometimes we do need to change certain attitudes. And then through that, maybe as well, those conversations at home can change. Also, can I just say one more thing? Um, when we when we do speak about mental health, and I think that everything else just that hits the nail on the head, um, the the one big issue with mental health is a lot of people carry a lot of shame with them that something is wrong with me, um, I, I, and and I just want to say that every time you know you you start putting yourself or labeling yourself as feeling shameful of the problem you're going through, you're you're taking seven steps behind from getting the kind of help that you should be getting. Um, a mental health is not something to feel bad about. It is it is a, a way in which your mind functions, and if you are falling into a pattern that doesn't perhaps go with the way in which a human should be thinking and behaving, then you should get help, and there's nothing wrong in getting help, because exactly. because the more you, the more you prolong that kind of thinking and say, oh, I, I feel bad and I feel horrible, and what is the, what this, this this pathetic question of what is this world going to think of me, has has been has been what uh, you know, has been the biggest problem ever, you know. Um, so I think it's also got to do with having that sense of security. And as we spoke a little while earlier, that insecurity, that something is wrong with me. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, that was in another sense. But but you have to have that confidence and courage to say that, yes, uh, I have an issue. I, I, I am not thinking the right way. And, and mm -hmm. help is available. And if I'm really open to changing for the better, for humanity, and for the way in which I'm okay if tomorrow my wife is in a better position than I am financially and has a better job than me, I, it should not be a problem. It should not be an issue because uh, just because you know she's done very well, and women are educating themselves and doing very very well for themselves. And many times men have a problem that you know why is she earning more in the family? Uh, you know, it's just some um, preset taboos that we have to get rid of. Yeah, more yes. than that. It's just mindset that's been running on for decades and decades. Um, on the similar topic, was, um, you've recently made a film on domestic violence. So why don't you tell us more about the film that you worked and made on? Yes, so um, it was to do with White Ribbon Day as well um, last year, and it was done with a local council here in Melbourne. Um, but it was more around, you know, we've spoken about social media, and um, it was around, I guess, young people nowadays as well um i guess a way that they show their love and this is called um uncomfortable questions is uh or uncomfortable topics i should say is that one of the way that they show their love or affection is maybe by showing nude photos to their partner right and and this is something that young people do um you know if you can't see them in person you you might send them a photo you know if they're your boyfriend or girlfriend and that's what young people do um and met, possibly, you know, adults as well and older adults. So this is a way of showing your affection. However, one of the issues that we're finding is that when uh, a couple may break up is that sometimes out of revenge, uh, the ex-boyfriend may use those photos as bribery. He may use those photos um, as something to get back and may use that against the girl to show to her parents which can have a horrible effect on a reputation and, and amongst the community or even at school. Now, this is illegal here in Victoria, but again, this is something that we as men need to know that this is not okay at all. Um, even if somebody sends you a nude photo, this is somebody's private property and you cannot do that without consent. And so we made a video basically based on that, um, that somebody was showing one of the characters his photos of his ex-girlfriend and the uh, his friend felt uncomfortable and his friend spoke out. So if you're one of those friends that happens to see one of these photos and your mate is showing, hey, hey, look, look at this photo of my ex-girlfriend, she's naked, you need to call them out and you need to say that's not okay and that's not right and uh, you can't do that. Um, so that is what the film was about. 
That's that's wonderful. That's that's a good initiative because I know many people suffer from that, and I've actually seen reports coming out from ladies saying that um, they've been blackmailed and whatnot. But on that note, and I'm very mindful of the time as well. One question that's been popping in my mind for a while: many cases we come across where women have played the role of victim. They've just kind of wanted to play the role of the victim card to kind of you know take revenge on the ex-boyfriends and what not and many other stuff so in those cases where women are kind of doing this to their partners or women are inflicting damage mental emotional whatever how do we how do we differentiate between those women and women who actually need help how do we put the draw the line between these two categories of people um what do you guys think zuran i'll start with you first i'll get straight to the point i think the the one thing that changes the way in which what your question is about is the me too movement um and i think while uh, so much of it is genuine and i think of course it stems from the fact that a lot of women have been victims of uh you know the me too um i think that movement is also some, uh, in some way or the other has negatively affected the spiral that if one girl is speaking about it let me also add to the bandwagon and in the name of the movement let me also act like a victim which essentially is absolutely wrong because i know for a fact that um uh, you know if if you know 10000 people are making noise one more person adding to it only creates more noise doesn't add to the solution it 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 becomes a bigger problem now yes it's an issue yes it's absolutely true and i think uh you know there's, there there is strict punishment being implied on people i think i think uh, you know enough industries in the world are, are are getting to see the kind of punishment uh, or sort of a sentence based on a me too movement like that whether it's the film industry whether it's the corporate world but it, it's happening in its own way but definitely there is a change in the way in which it's being looked upon because the movement's quite large uh, however i think the the victim card is very very wrong how you can differentiate is by spending time with the person uh, you know sort of who uh, you know portrays herself as being a victim uh many a times and i think it's got to do with instinct it's got to do with um, just knowing a certain vibe you know people um until you know them you don't know them uh, and and i'm not saying you're always right of course people can be different uh, five years down the line they can change more or less you tend to know that um is she being genuine uh, and and i've and i've got a lot of friends in my life who um, you know their partners have come out and said you know what i've gone through this and i know it because i know the guy very well and i know him extremely well and and, and he's the one person who everyone will say beautiful things about and if that one girl is saying you know he's not treating me nicely i i i'm i'm proud to believe everybody else because i know him too and i and i know from my scruff of my teeth that he would never do anything to hurt a girl because i i just know it um and and he said look bro at the end of the day it's become such a movement it's become such a change of times where um you know it, it, i i think to get a false sense of authority to get a false sense of um you know um how do i say it like like you know what everyone's come to it now let me just now now my job's easier and that's not right uh what is happening in terms of sexual abuse so, uh, sexual violence um is very wrong it should stop it, it is it is just unacceptable but but to wrongly accuse somebody who's done nothing to you just because the world's doing it and just because it's trending on social media and just because it's become a matter of conversation is is not right amazing oh oz do you have anything to add on top of it uh yeah i'll um talking to that question in a different way i think um you know it because it's such a difficult area in terms of um especially you kind of let that process go through um i think there's still more pressure on the woman though in terms of you know we have this historical element of uh people putting more pressure on women again we've talked about this earlier in terms of it's very hard or difficult for them to say something because they may not be believed um you know and i think it even makes it harder when we have say if we've got friends and we say oh you know he's a good guy and stuff it may make it difficult for the women to be believed and i think it's important that we let kind of that legal process play out um and that you know just realizing that historically women have had it difficult when they've tried to do this in the past and that in something you know we we've, we've got to take it for um the understanding of and just let that process play out so um i'm all about hearing out both sides of the story awesome um unfortunately we have to kind of wrap this session but before i go just one last one last line like if you have to give a closing line you both are like 
social media influencers and all that. So uh, if you have to use social media to encourage positive enlightenment, how would you do that? Just like as a taking away message from this whole episode, how would you use social media? Oza, I'll start with you first. Um, I would show more of the real side of myself and despite the real sides of myself, still maintain uh, the good values. So yes, I have bad days. Yes, I have days where things don't go well for me, uh, where work doesn't go well. I lose this, I lose that. But that doesn't mean I lose my morals or my values. They still stay anchored. Very nicely put. Uh, Zoran, finishing line from you. I think, um, firstly, uh, the most important thing is show compassion. And apart from being thoughtful, also be mindful. And, and uh, it's one thing that people love to kind of express themselves, but, but it's difficult to execute it. So while it's wonderful to uh, express yourself, um, just show compassion and, and, and just sort of, you know, uh, think before you say something or do something. It's as simple as that. Wonderful, wonderful. And I think as a woman, my role would be to kind of make sure if I have a son, I bring you up in the best way possible so that when he has a partner, he treats her the best way possible. And I bring that chain forward. So that would be my contribution to this whole episode. Um, all right. That was super awesome talking to both of you. It was just a very heartwarming conversation to see the least. And I'm pretty sure that our listeners will take something back home when they listen to all of us talking about this. With that i would really like to thank both of you for coming over and having a chat with me and thank you and have a good night and to all our listeners please let us know what you feel about us we'll get back to you very soon with another episode thank you and have a great night thank you thanks a lot thank you.